Today is July 23rd, 2015. My name is Teresa Beer Larson. I'm speaking with Norma Lucille Chalateau Morgan uh, at Northcrest here in Ames. Norma, do I have your permission to record your voice and take your picture this morning? Yes. Great, thank you. Please tell me when and where you were born. I was born here in Ames at Mary Greeley Hospital. And what was the date? November 26, 1925. Of course, we want to concentrate on your life and your memories, but let's talk a little bit about your uh, mom and dad. Should we start with your dad first? Okay. Uh, what was his, his business or what was his profession? Why was he in Ames when you were born? He worked at the uh, Highway Commission. Of course, that's the DOT now but he was in the soils testing laboratory here in Ames. How did he land that job? Why was he doing that particular kind of work? Well, I suppose it grew from <clears throat> his um, study at Iowa State, and he did go to Iowa State University for several years, but I don't, I don't believe he graduated. Your father had lots of hobbies. Your father had Lots of interests. He was kind of a renaissance man. Tell me about some of the things he liked to do. Well, uh, he was a great hunter and really enjoyed it. Uh, when he grew up, he told me he'd been active in trapping for animals and things of that sort, for pelts. And then <clears throat> as he went along, he was always involved in some kind of a project which was going to make a million dollars, of course, but uh, he was a very interesting man. So he was quite a good hunter. Uh, he was a good marksman. He was a good shot. Oh, yes. Uh, did he compete? <laughs> yes. He uh, competed a lot in, within the state, and then uh, several years Starting in 1933, I think, he was going to the National uh, Trap Shoot in Dayton, Ohio. And one year he won one event out there. It's the handicap event. The trap shooting is divided into just regular 16-yard distance and also then handicap for people that have a better record. And so that's what he was in. You um, remember this fairly vividly. Were you were you there? Oh yes. Um, the one year my mom and I stayed in a tent on the grounds out there, and he was working in their office, which was one way of affording to go. <laughs> Your mother um, graduated from Iowa State University. Yes. And uh, there weren't that many women who went to Iowa State University at that time period, let alone graduate. Can you give me the rough time period there? I was thinking maybe late 19-teens, something like that? I think probably about 18 to maybe 21 or 22. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> she was a motor board while she was at Iowa State. So she distinguished herself academically. Motor board is an mm -hmm. honorary. Yes. She was a good student, obviously, and she took uh, home economics and then later taught for a year or two in Chicago Heights. Did she ever happen to mention the flu e epidemic? I know there was quite a flu academic epidemic at oh, Iowa yes. State University. Uh -huh. They were quarantined. And my dad was in the Navy at the time, so he, he had the flu. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they must have survived in good health. They did. Mm -hmm. Well, let's um, move then to back to some of your life experiences um, here in Ames. Uh, you didn't actually live in Ames proper as a wee child. Uh, tell me where you lived. We lived out in the country, about five miles, and it was in the area south of the uh, gateway now. 
had, had an acreage. Uh, it was near the old agronomy farm. <clears throat> so my mother and I used to walk from our house, which was about a quarter mile, up to the corner, and that's where we went to get our mail. And we also carried a pail and, and got milk from them. I believe um, the current uh, road in town is called Oakwood Road. Were you along yes, that road? Um, our country school was on that road. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were south of town and your father worked at the Highway Commission, what happened in bad weather? You were quite a ways away. Yes, he, um, he would have to walk down the railroad tracks to get to town if the roads weren't open. Mm -hmm. And he did that several times. So you must have started to, to a one-room school at Oakwood School. Mm -hmm. um, about how old were you when you started? Well, normally I would have started at the same age everybody else did. But when I was in school at Oakwood, <clears throat> there were only, I would have been the only one in first grade. And there were three people in second grade. And so they put me in with three. So. I started out actually in kind of first, second grade together. Tell me about the learning environment in a one-room school. What, what was your day like? Oh, it was normal school day, I guess. You go and sit in a desk and you brought your lunch in a lunch pail, had recesses, <clears throat> which were, you know, everybody played together. It wasn't just one grade. Uh, we did all kinds of usual things at recesses. Did you do any unusual things at recesses? I think I told you. We, we um, sometimes would go out in the pasture and take a pail of water and pour it in the gopher hole so you'd see where they came up. And that, that was very really entertaining. We enjoyed that. It seems like you might have had a lot of leeway to create your own fun. Yes, we had to. I thought it was interesting too that whenever, whenever I got sick, my mother would spend the day pretty much making doll clothes for me. And that was, that was nice. Well, she obviously had home economic skills, yes. as many women did, but she was a a well-trained home, oh, home economist. Yes. <laughs> home economist. She didn't sew a lot, but she mm -hmm. did do that when, when I needed it. Um, one more thing about uh, country school and the academics. Um, did you find that they were, you know, fairly rigorous? I mean, did you have fun? Did you remember like the joy of learning how to read, or or was there anything like that that you remember about the academics of? Well, I guess I what I remember is, um, of course, it was one room, but there was <clears throat> some sort of separation to, in the front of the room where there was a table for the people that were concentrating on learning something new or that sort. Um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned that we, um, I, when we moved to town, I was in fifth grade, and it was probably, I was about a year behind in most subjects. And I don't think that was the fault of the country school, it's just the way things work out. But anyway, <clears throat> I had to decide then whether to stay in the grade I was in or to go back and pick up. And I wanted to stay where I was, of course. and. Uh, So, so, in terms of the academics, um, basically, you started school quite young, and yes. so then you were always already bumped up a grade. So it would have been a challenge. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, now you uh, you have no other siblings, so the um, you you not only the school kids were kind of like your extended family um, in a way. Um, you had a teacher at Oakwood School, Mrs. Smith. So. Yes. Hey, tell me about her. She was, I suppose she was a normal teacher. She was very nice. And 
<clears throat> I guess the thing I remember about her is we had the same birthday. So she was born November 26th, whatever year that was. Mm -hmm. And then I remember after, oh, later on, she had a Halloween party for us at her house in town. Mm -hmm. And that was lots of fun. Mm -hmm. I had never been to anything quite like that before, but it was nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you moved to town in fifth grade, I believe uh, you told me that you started to school at Roosevelt School? Yes. Is that right? Um, can you tell me uh, where you lived and then uh, if you walked to school, um, to Roosevelt School? We lived on South Maple and just about a block of Lincoln Way. <clears throat> there was a little grocery store on the corner of Lincoln Way. And we used to go there and buy penny candy mostly, maybe some other things like bread. But um, you know, I walked to school, and uh, at the time, some of the time we walked through the underpass, which was fairly new then. And the other other times we would go up Maple Street, and there was a way through to cross the tracks up there that still live. That you can go across there, and uh, so then we'd walk up that way. I was asking that question because actually that's really quite uh, a challenge for a young child because Highway 30, you had to cross Highway 30, mm -hmm. and you had to cross the railroad tracks. So you had some. Uh, well, the uh, railroad challenge. tracks weren't very hard. <laughs> well, that's true, but you had to watch for the trains, I guess. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Uh, Roosevelt School, as you now know, in this year, 2015, has been converted to um, living condominiums. Mm -hmm. But when you went, um, it was a, quite a majestic school. You, you'd come from a one-room mm -hmm. schoolhouse. Describe for me what Roosevelt School looked like for you. Well, it was a, seemed like a large building. Um, as I go back and see it now, the furnishings are all very small and it doesn't, it doesn't look like I remember quite, but um, it was it was a good school. And uh, one thing I remember, I think, is that fifth graders tend to be kind of rowdy, and, and uh, that was something I wasn't used to. <laughs> oh, uh, as far as the building is concerned, can you remember any of the building features that impressed you? Mainly the stairways, I guess. <clears throat> The stairways just were, as I mentioned, I think very small steps, and uh, it was, but yes, it was nice. Mm -hmm. It was a brick building, mm -hmm. it was more than I was used to, obviously. At um, Roosevelt School, you said you started when you were uh, in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, what did the fifth graders do for fun? This must have been much different than the kinds of things that you did in the country. Well, yes, and uh, <clears throat> at that time there was a, a campfire group that started, and uh, there was a group of about 20 of us, and the same 20 stayed together pretty well through the high school. A nice group, and we met in the basement of the leader, and she always had stimulating things for us to do, everything from beaded head work and that kind of thing, or, um, projects with our hands, or, mm -hmm. and then of course we can't. Would that be at Camp Canwita? Yes. Was it called Camp Canwita then? Yes, it was. And <clears throat> we, got, we spent a lot of time down there, kind of along the river. Mm -hmm. And she was a great one for teaching us about various plants and trees and things, and so we do that a lot. <clears throat> we also played ball, and uh, were you were you an athlete? Were you an active girl? <laughs> I guess I was active. I wasn't what I call an athlete, but I, you know, I did play tennis and. 
various friendly things. Mm -hmm. um, did you have tennis lessons or did you just pick it up with friends? I think I got it at school. Mm -hmm. Okay. I always like to ask people um, who have a long experience with Ames um, about Carr's Pool. Did you spend? Oh, yes. Loved Carr's Pool. And spent a lot of time there. Um, <clears throat> one of the crazy things is um, one day there was a little puppy in the, in the dressing room and he was sleeping. And I couldn't quite stand it because I liked Duffy Puffy so much. So I nudged him with my foot to wake him up and he bit me. <laughs> so that time I had to go to the doctor and get a shot for it. But it was my own fault. <laughs> did you go to Carr's Pool on bicycles or did your mom take you? I think they must have taken me. I don't. Mm -hmm. After I was in town, I might have gone on the bicycle. Mm -hmm. I remember the big top that was in there that everybody liked, and the great high tower, which I didn't jump off of, but lots of people did. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have swimming lessons? Have what? Did you have swimming lessons? Uh, yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. In the summer, would you have spent maybe at least one afternoon a week there? I don't know how often we went, but it seems to me, as far as lessons go, <clears throat> we had to um, pass a certain test, you know, to be able to go in the deep end and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And I did that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's return to uh, Roosevelt at school for um, just a moment. Um, you told me in a previous conversation that one of the things that kind of puzzled you about coming to Roosevelt was music class. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Um, the country school, we, we sang, and we did little programs for the parents and things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, when I came to town, the music classes were talking about octaves and notes and whole notes and half notes and, well, you know, all those things, which I learned later, but um, mm -hmm. I didn't know much but when, when I moved in. Um, we'll pick up the music thread a little bit um, later, but um, I, I just have to ask this question because I ask this of all people, uh, because it says something about the time period. For fifth graders or sixth graders, older elementary school kinds of people. What would children do if they got in trouble? In other words, what was considered getting in trouble at that time? <laughs> I don't remember the punishment. I remember get scolded for it or mm -hmm. you'd have to sit in the hall or something for a while. Uh, I guess what I meant was what kind of behavior might warrant a correction? What kind of things did kids do to act out? I think they tended to go to the bathroom more often than they needed to, <laughs> and then <clears throat> just the kind of things that kids would maybe throw down the hall or something of that mm -hmm. sort. Yeah. Uh, well, let's move on to um, what's known as junior high at your time, or maybe it was mm -hmm. called middle school. And what was this? Where was the school building located? Uh, that you attended. Sorry, that's a convoluted sentence. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, at the at time I was there, we were building the new high school, which is where the city hall is. And the middle school, or the junior high, was across the street. And of course, there was a tunnel between the two, so we could go from one to the other. And for <clears throat> at least one year, maybe two years, we went half days while they were building on one side, they'd be keeping us busy somewhere else. <clears throat> and I think it was like the junior high went half day and the senior high went the other half. Mm -hmm. well, that would be a challenging experience, I would think. <laughs> well, like school started earlier in the morning and lasted later in the afternoon, mm -hmm. but you did have that half day that was free. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And let's talk a little bit about the school subjects you took. By then, were you taking home economics? Did you take home, home economics? I is think it? there was one class in uh -huh. home ec. Yes. It was not a major thing mm -hmm. for me. Right. But <clears throat> mainly I remember Latin. <laughs> I did have two years of Latin in high school. And uh, at that time, I was a friend with a girl that was very good in Latin, and so she and I used to study together, and that helped like one, you know, that made it easy. <laughs> How did Latin help you later in life? I think it helps with vocabulary. A lot of times you can see the origin of rooms, mm -hmm. worms, right. Rooms. Uh, along about this time, I think um, you got interested in band music. And here you were, you, you came to Roosevelt and kind of struggled through the notes and the octaves <laughs> and the staff, and then you, you go on to pick up which instrument? Well, I started with clarinet. <clears throat> Actually, I never had a very good clarinet, but I had a clarinet. And <clears throat> so I played that through junior high and for when I started in fifth grade. And I continued over into high school. And I remember they put me in the senior high band before I was really knowledgeable enough to be there. They'd be playing along and I'd be about a row behind. But anyway, that worked out. And then I, eventually I went to Iowa State and played one year in the Iowa State band and marching band. I, I think that was kind of an unusual thing for a woman to march in a band at that time. Yeah, there was a very short period when they had women in the marching band because the fellows were all gone. <laughs> the men were serving in World War II. Well, men were serving in World War II. Yes. Yes. So you would have been marching in band in, say, like 1941, 42, something I like that? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to come back to high school then for um, just a second. Uh, other people that I've talked to um, who've attended middle school and high school mm -hmm. at that location um, talk with fond memories about Moore's Dairy. Oh, yes. Did you get to enjoy the sweets there? Of course. It was well, so handy. We went there a lot, but I think I told you we... There was a time that I went through the tunnel from the one school to the other one and then across the street to Moore's and got in trouble, of course. <laughs> oh, you went during the school day? I went down, actually I was going to a band practice and the band leader wasn't there and so a couple of us went over to Moore's. <laughs> it was a sweet treat, even, even now. Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, so you started to Iowa State, I think, in about 1942. Tell me about the um, academic study that you, you chose at that time. Well, I started in, I decided, I guess, I wanted to be a, in journalism. <clears throat> and in order to take journalism and home economics, I was in, had to take uh, either foods minor or a housing minor along with it. So the theory was that we'd have something to write about. They didn't have a journalism college at that time, not as, so you, and... Well, it was like a department. Mm -hmm. we, we still had that journalism building, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> the press building is where it still is, but they've enlarged it a lot. Mm -hmm. You were attending um, Iowa State University, well, it was Iowa State College at that time, mm -hmm. um, at a very critical time in U.S. history. Yes. Uh, because World War II was um, in, engaging mm -hmm. the world, and the United States, and, and of course, on a very local level, Iowans. Um, how did that big world event affect your collegiate years? Well, of course it takes all the fellows out of school for a long time. <clears throat> and 
for a while that the um, fraternities closed and they put servicemen in there and so the girls were moved into other buildings. <clears throat> I think probably the most interesting part of it was <clears throat> the, the uh, involvement of the university in the war project. And we had a little building that, where they were working on material for the atomic bomb. And it was just a little building over near the press building, but they called it little, the students called it Little Ankeny. It wasn't called that by anything or anything official. But anyway, we all knew what Little Ankeny was, and we all knew people that worked there. And we also knew that <clears throat> they started in the chemistry building, and it used to be kind of frightening if they'd hear something like a loud crash in the <laughs> chemistry <laughs> building. It didn't bother the students as much, but you could see the teachers were reacting. <laughs> so that was interesting. Help me understand why it was called Little Ankeny. Well, because there was a war plant at Ankeny. And so this was just a way of abbreviating that, I guess. So the War Department wasn't very good at keeping the secret of what they were actually working on from these very smart Iowa State students. You had figured it out. Oh, yes. I think, we, well, we didn't know what they were doing in there. We just knew it was something, and, and they didn't want any of us to know what it was. <clears throat> of course, the, the train track came in, and apparently they loaded this stuff on the train and took it to Chicago mm -hmm. frequently. And so, you wonder what's going on. And you were a journalistic person, so you you naturally ask questions yourself. <laughs> well, you tended to just assume that it was normal, and sometimes it came out that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, they, they didn't appreciate seeing anything in print that related to it. <laughs> I'm sure. sure. Did you ever get censored in that regard, or did you ever write? Did you ever write something about what was going on in that? The only thing I remember writing was, um, <clears throat> it was a, a wedding story, and I simply made the comment that the bridegroom worked at Little Ankeny, and I didn't think anything of it. But I had a visitor from some military people saying, "You don't do that." <laughs> Another time, I guess I had, there were some classmates standing out in front of the press building, and I was taking a picture of it, and they came and took the film. That would be, that would signal to me anyway, that it's highly classified, and it would almost raise my curiosity even more. Did it yours? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we weren't supposed to know about it. <clears throat> yeah. And they didn't make a big fuss about it, you know. They, if they came and interviewed you, it was very quietly. Mm -hmm. There were other ways that um, the the war affected everybody, like mm -hmm. shortages. What uh, you actually had a car, didn't you, at Iowa State? You I had, did have a car, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was just unusual. Mm -hmm. It was it was not a fancy car at all. <clears throat> My, pet, my dad was running a restaurant at the time, and he had a little car that he used to haul meat in. And I started putting pressure on to let me have that school. And he ended up getting a different car that was a little better car, but and I had, had that. Mm -hmm. uh, could you get gasoline and tires for it? Get what? Could you get gasoline and tires for your car? Not as easily. Mm -hmm. You get a limited amount of gasoline mm -hmm. and probably not tires. <laughs> you did mention that there were servicemen housed in dormitories and other facilities mm -hmm. um, around um, Iowa State. and. Uh, this must have been sort of attractive to girls that there were <laughs> boys around. Uh, they were navy uniforms, most of them. Uh huh. 
you seem to recall. That's good. Um, now, I, you had told me at an earlier date that there was um, a little restaurant that was on Knapp Street. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be kind of close to the railroad tracks that was yes. there. Mm -hmm. I believe it's called Beasley's. Beatty's. 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 Uh -huh. um, now, connect the dots for me. Yeah, you went to Beatty's once. Somebody did. And what did you buy? <laughs> well, we went to Beatty's a lot, but um, <clears throat> one of the girls had a boyfriend that was living in Friling Hall at the time, which was where they were headquartered. <clears throat> and they found that we could get out and get to Beatty's after hours. <clears throat> so we ended up, she and I were, would take my car and fill it up with boxes full of Beatty burgers, hamburgers, and take them over and they'd unload them at one of the back doors at Riley Hall, and then they would go inside with them and peddle them around to their friends. I like the entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> Well, it's just one of those things that comes out. <laughs> um, uh, while you were um, at Iowa State University, um, tell me where you lived. I, well, the first year I was in Roberts Hall mm -hmm. and then moved into the sorority house. And so I lived there after that. Mm -hmm. Full disclosure. Full disclosure for anybody who might be listening to this, you and I share a bond that I didn't know about until just about a week ago, that we're both members of the same sorority. Oh, yeah. Alpha Delta Pi. Right. Yeah. Um, there are some famous um, Alpha Delta Pi um, alums. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, did any of them visit the house when you were a student there? Oh. Well, we mentioned the other day Ada Hayden came to Ada Pie, <clears throat> and she'd come to a, um, official things when we'd invite her for meals or just to come over for an occasion that had to do with sorority. <clears throat> My remembrance of her is that when she came, she would go out in the kitchen and she'd make coffee for everybody. And of course we had the big coffee pot, but she would put the coffee in there and put in probably six eggs and break them up because that's what they did to keep them from getting cloudy. But we didn't say much about it. We just drank the coffee. It must have been fairly thick coffee. I think it was. <laughs> I didn't drink much coffee then in those <laughs> days, so. but yes. Do you remember anything else about Ada Hayden? Uh, did she talk about her work? Did no, she, she did didn't. She never talk I about didn't her work? know that until later when I found out who she was, you know, it didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that um, Dr. Margaret Sloss, who is a oh, yes. veterinarian, uh, do you recall her visiting the house? Very much. Um, I guess we used her as pretty much an advisor over the years. <clears throat> and when anybody would get in a little bit of trouble or want to know what to do about it, we'd go talk to Margaret Sloss. And she was wonderful. She could help solve problems. Of course, there's um, a building at Iowa State University named for her now, the mm -hmm. Margaret Sloss House. Um, anything else about Alpha Delta Pi that you'd like to share? Well, you just, I think you know, you said you knew um, Stafford. Jenny Stafford. Yeah, mm -hmm. Jenny Stafford, who was a national officer. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know what, well, okay. yeah, now, there was a, at that time period, um, young men and women who were in fraternities and sororities did not sleep in heated rooms. No. You. We had dormitories. You had dormitories, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were, I think they were called cold air dormitories. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, did, what did you, 
do for fun. I think there might have been some card playing going on. Oh, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> we sat down on the hall floor anywhere and played bridge, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of dancing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just women, and sometimes when there were fellows around. Mm -hmm. uh, so I believe you met your husband at Iowa State University. Yes. And um, he uh, was in a fraternity. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, uh, was not called up because of medical reasons? He had some surgery when he was 18, and that disqualified him, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the war gave some unique opportunities to men, too, because uh, there weren't very many around, so he probably had to be... <laughs> he, uh, well, the limited number of them, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he probably had opportunities for leadership in his house. Oh, yes. He, mm -hmm. was, he was a house president at one time. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I think about opportunities for leadership, um, that was a unique time, really, for women in many ways. That Very much. You had some chances to do things you might not have. We, uh, I spent a lot of time in the press building. And... <clears throat> At that time, the editor and almost all, even the sports editor, were women. And that was unusual, and up to that time they'd all been male. But we had some good women doing mm -hmm. things. Were you an editor for the ISU Daily? Just the society editor. Mm -hmm. And you um, had opportunities, did you have opportunities to work on the bomb? I know those are two separate publications, but... Actually, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I could have, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. I would, I always, um, before I conclude, give um, a person an opportunity to, to reflect on anything else about your rich and wonderful life experience in Ames. Is there anything else that you would like to tell me that um, I haven't asked you or that you'd like to share? Hmm. Can't think of anything right now? <clears throat> well, I don't know. There were... <clears throat> There were numerous things, so there were beauty affairs, <clears throat> and I was one of the finalists for Bond Beauty one year. But I believe that. Oh. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Journalism gave you an opportunity to interview a lot of interesting people and at the time <clears throat> I got assigned to most of the people that were in the administrating building, Dean Houser and uh, the women that were in charge of the women's programs. I think Dean Gaskell was in there. <clears throat> I can't remember who all they were but there, there were people well, and Mr. Brown in the library. He had occasion to visit with them and found mm -hmm. out they were remarkably nice people when you mm -hmm. interviewed them. I do agree that having a background in journalism does give you a chance to interview very interesting people. Because mm -hmm. I'm getting to do that right now with <laughs> you. <laughs> and uh, just one, one more open-ended question about your um, childhood in Ames and any friends or activities, is there anything else that you would like to share with me about childhood well, names? <clears throat> something made me think about the train station. And of course, <clears throat> the trains went under what's now the, the um, underpass. <clears throat> but in the beginning days, there was a little restaurant down under there. And my grandmother worked in that. And so, um, she made pies and things for them all the time. And she lived there, right, kind of where the streets come together. And so I'd get to stay overnight with her sometimes, and that was kind of a delight. 
Well, you have just extended your um, Ames heritage back another generation that oh. I didn't know about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending time with me, Norma. I very much appreciate your reflections about growing up and living in Ames in past decades. And I um, hope that uh, you've enjoyed the experience as well. I did. I'll thank you very much, but also apologize for my voice. It isn't always like this. <laughs> I think it sounds very good. Well, so thank you. Thank you for our time together. You're welcome.